fellow Muslims, if you care about Palestine just because of an Aqsa and distort our anti-colonial struggle as religious, so you're disturbed and not better than Zionists. You fetishize Palestinians and are driven by your religious ideas. So I think this is a, a, a nasty attack on the worldview of a Muslim who uh, his, he, he is uh, uh, trying to go about this because of his religious belief. Because Allah yeah. subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us about right and wrong, number one, and about uh, the special place of Al-Aqsa, number two. So it's not solely because of Al-Aqsa. Aqsa is not in China, but we care about the Uyghurs. Aqsa is not in India, but we care about the Muslims in Uttar Pradesh and other places. So it seems to me that um, it's a bit excessive, her thing. She's like, so if you're not anti-colonialist in your mindset, you're nothing like, you're just like a Zionist. What are your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll actually respectfully correct the sister by saying that Zionism in and of itself is Islamophobic. And yeah. so by you standing in front of Zionism, you have to be pro-Islam, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And that is just at the core of it. Zionists aim to destroy the land, the holy land of, of Muslims. And yeah. that's what we see from this current administration is that they are bombing our masajid. They are bombing our places of worship. They are raiding them on a weekly basis. They're not letting our brothers and sisters pray a regular Jum'ah Salah. And we know, especially, especially throughout the year, that when it comes to Ramadan, when it comes to our most holy times during the year, Zionists escalate their attacks. And so from an activist point of view, from anyone that is standing so-called against colonization, you have to realize that you have to do counter attacks to that by supporting Al-Aqsa so much more, by supporting our brothers and sisters in Palestine and the Muslim and the Islamic movement so much more in and of itself. And then also, I, I want to say that the media, and, and, and you mentioned this, has played this idea of what a Muslim is to so many people that even people within the movement fall into. That, a, a, that you can't be anti-colonial and you can't be uh, religious at the same time. Which is which isn't true at all. You can be, you must be anti-colonial and pro-Islam and pro-liberation uh, at the same time, and that is how we achieve success. But if you're willing to take out one over the other, especially religion, you can take out colonialism. You can you can be pro-colonialism, and I've seen this. You can be pro-colonialism, but pro-religion. But because religion is at your core, eventually you'll be anti-colonial. Because religion is what dictates your movements moving forward. Yeah. So, did you do you ever talk to someone like like her? Do you do do you communicate with her and try to like um, uh, get her to understand? You this, know, this your perspective. Very often, where for example, we're at a rally, yeah. and this is a very this is a very regular chant that we sometimes say. We say La ilaha illallah wa shahid habib Allah, for example. Yeah. And brothers and sisters would come up to us after, and they ask us to stop saying the shin. When you ask them why. They're saying you're making the movement too religious and you are, you're pushing away people from it. And the reality is a lot of these people that actually come up with these remarks are Muslim as well. But I am certain that they are missing a certain piece within their faith that requires religion to be the foundation in anything that we do, regardless of any kind of justice movement. If it is a justice movement, then it is grounded in Islam. And you cannot remove the Islamic aspect and still call it a justice movement. And that is something that I try portraying to, to many people. A lot of them become very understanding, but then there's also a lot of them that were rooted and have the foundation of un-Islamic principles. And that really steers them to a different direction. And let me ask something. I can understand when there's equal powers that a person doesn't think of Allah and relies on his own powers, right? We say you're wrong, but... I, I get it. It's human beings can do that, right? right? But when you are so weak in power, you have no country, no state will support you, right? Uh, the entire world, and you see here, Elon Musk, supposedly one of the most powerful guys in the world, Cohen and doing a humiliation ritual with right. Ben Shapiro and Auschwitz and then saying, I don't know, I'm aspirationally Jewish. I was Jewish. It's almost like my best friend is black, right? right. You know that whole trope. And uh, I think uh, my great grandmother was Jewish. What kind of like power that are you facing? So when you you're, you're the power distinction is that great, it makes you think where is real power, right? 
Now at that time, you are ripe to to actually realize, oh, the real power is with all this. So what I would like to ask is, what is the perception of who has power to these to to the to the secular uh, uh, or uh, view of the resistance? Like, where are they getting their power from? Do they actually think that their material power is going to stand up against Israel and the United States and Western Europe? Right. I think that that is that is such a a core point because. They a, a lot of the, a lot of those people that have those certain views are coming from a place that the people are the only ones that have the power, and we are going to be the ones that are going to achieve liberation and justice and so on and and stop the Zionist entity. But who has true power is a missing conversation in and of itself. Like it's not even something that comes up. Mm-hmm. Where if you ask someone who has the true power, you're going to go in circles with them. They're going to tell you the colonizers, the people and so on, and the concept of there being a higher power is completely absent from the conversation. Yeah. And I think that is what is so missing, and I always mention this, is that this is so missing within the movement, and it's what we need shuyukh and students of knowledge to talk about more. It's like in our masajid, when we talk about rallies, talk about the religious aspect within rallies. Talk about why it is so important for one extra Muslim for one extra sheikh, for one extra student of knowledge to be there compared to 10 secular people, for example, where even that one person can make huge waves because we know that it is, it's like secularism versus like the religious societies isn't something that is stagnant, but yeah. rather it is something that is almost combative against each other. That as soon as Muslims take a back seat, secularism will take advantage of that and yeah. will move forward. And that's something that Muslims have to wake up to, that if you choose to take the back seat, you're okay with secularization being the norm. And vice versa, where Muslims stepping up in a very active way will force secularization to take the back seat. Mm-hmm. And, and I would go so far as to say, without really sounding too divisive, but Iblis will love a secular pro-Palestine movement, right? Because you are impotent. Right. And you're going to rely on yourself and you're probably going to make things worse. Right. And nothing will scare, uh, scare even your enemy uh, than that you believe that something's greater than him. Right. right. And when a person has that belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that that's the real power at, at a certain point, then it triggers a lot of other things. So if this is the real power, then why is this happening, right? There right. must be a wisdom why it's happening, right? I think the triggering point that you mentioned is, is really important because I was thinking about this and I saw a post by the front of Muhammad, which I'm not sure if you've seen her graduation speech. She was posted on the front cover of the New York Times and attacked a lot for her pro-Palestinian speech on her CUNY law graduation. Mm-hmm. But she recently posted something as she was applying for, for jobs to be a lawyer. She was saying a lot of these Zionists threaten her that you're never going to find a job. You're never going to find any means of feeding your family and and so-called. But she wrote this post and she was mentioning, she was like, do they not know that Ar-Razak is who is going, is the one that has written my Riz from before them, from before time. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is so missing is because when you fear nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you know that at the core of your movement is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is the greatest power, then truly nothing can come in front of you that will truly scare you. And those are the triggering aspects that are missing within the movement without that, without that first step of recognizing that at the core of it is Allah is the, Allah is the greatest. When we put, that's what's so beautiful. When we put that at the core and at the foundation, that Allah is the only one who has power, at that point, really... Every trajectory we go on is going to be a little bit different than than one who doesn't have that. Actually, it's going to end up right. being a lot different. Uh, 